I am pleased to uh, once again uh, play host to uh, Milton Friedman, who is now attached to Stanford. Is I, that, um, well, I don't know what attached is and where we're looking for. The Hoover Institution, yeah. which is what, a, a, an academic? Uh, oh, yes, the Hoover Institution is, uh, was set up in honor of President Hoover. It's been there for a long time, and it's uh, called the Hoover Institution for War, Revolution, and Peace. And they decided a while back that they had enough peace, so they invited me to be his fellow there for a while. Uh, <laughs> uh, would Her Herbert Hoover be pleased with, what the, with the dialogue that's uh, going on under the aegis of his name? Oh, I'm sure he would. He was a great student. He was not only an engineer, yeah. but the library, the, who, it was founded as a library based initially on the collection of ma uh, documents and manuscripts he had collected in his public career. Yeah. Am I to assume that you wish that uh, he had defeated FDR in 1930? Uh, that's a very, very complicated question. Okay, but you're not all crazy about the New Deal, I trust. Huh? Oh, on the contrary. I think the situation in 1932 was a very terrible situation, but it had been produced by the failures of the Federal Reserve System in the prior four years. It was not a failure of capitalism, it was a failure of government. And Herbert Hoover himself, in his memoirs at the end of that time, said he had learned to his sorrow that the Federal Reserve was a, was a weak read for a nation in time of trouble. Uh, so that it, you can't blame Hoover for the Depression, you can't blame business for the Depression, but Hoover has to take some of the blame. All right. Much of what Roosevelt did in the New Deal was unwise, but much of it was necessary. You can't again give a black and white I uh, judgment. All right, let's try some black and white questions, although okay. there are no anathema to economists. Uh, one of the wonderful things about you is that when you speak I almost always understand you, and that, <laughs> that's a real breakthrough for, for you and for me as well. Uh, the, the government should help save Chrysler. We need three auto companies. The governor, uh, government has been helping to kill Chrysler, but it should not help to save Chrysler. Of course not. Uh, Chry <laughs> this is a private enterprise system. It's often described as a profit system, but that's a misleading label. It's a profit and loss system. And the loss part is even more important than the profit, because it's what gets rid of badly managed, poorly operated companies. Yeah. The, 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 what does? Losses. When Chrysler loses money... Oh, I see. So, all right, when Chrysler loses money, it's got to do something. When Amtrak loses money, it goes to Congress and gets a bigger appropriation. The question at issue is, should the people in this country bail out Chrysler by taking money out of their pockets, not to buy cars which they want to buy, but to pay for whatever has been the cause of the losses at Chrysler? Government has been responsible for many of those losses by unrealistic regulations and rules, but they've affected all of the companies. You're not going to condemn uh, regulations uh, regarding emission and... Uh, I certainly am. Of course I'm going to condemn them. Why not? Because if we don't have them, you're, going, you're not going to be able to breathe, and you and I will not be in our senior years able to sit around and argue with each other. Well, those are assertions. They are statements that are made, but they are far from being correct. The fact is that uh, p pollution was going down long before we had any emission requirements, and it would go down without them. There is a case for doing something about pollution, but the way we've been going about it is the wrong way. Is there a case for the government to do something yes, about it? Yes, there is a case for the government to do something about it, because there's always a case for the government, to some extent, when what two people do affects a third party. There's no case for the government whatsoever in mandating airbags. Because airbags protect the people inside the car. That's my business. If I want to protect myself, I should do it at my expense. But there is a... <laughs> but there is a case for the government protecting third parties, protecting people who have not voluntarily agreed to enter. So there's more of a case, for example, for uh, emission control than there is for airbags. Mm -hmm. But the question is, what's the best way to do it? And the best way to do it is not to have bureaucrats in Washington write rules and regulations saying that a car has to carry this, that, or the other. The best way to do it is to impose a tax on the amount of pollu po pollutants emitted by a car and make it in the self-interest of, of the car manufacturers and of the consumers to keep down the amount of pollution in that way. But how would you put a monetary value on particulate matter which is emitted from the end of an exhaust pipe. You do it now. What do you mean, how do you do it? You now require people to spend something like $500 per car 
for the purpose, supposedly, of reducing partic particulate matter, which means for the purpose of giving them an incentive to disconnect the, uh, <laughs> yeah. the equipment that's supposed to reduce pollution. You mean the owner? Does. People are going out of their way. Yeah. Same with the buzzer. I assume that you... Uh, have you ever met Ralph Nader? Of course. I've debated Ralph Nader many times. Uh, and I assume you feel that... His, what, what, what is it that troubles you about him? I think he's wrong. It, <laughs> um, uh, I think... I think, I don't have any doubt about his sincerity, but I think sincerity is a much overrated virtue. I think what troubles me about him is that he wants to run my life for me instead of letting me run my life. Let's just take a couple of things. If it weren't for Ralph Nader, we would still have those ornaments on the hoods of cars which impale babies and women and children crossing streets. We would still have an auto industry which is totally focused on cosmetics at the expense of sound automotive engineering. We would still have... Uh, uh, an auto, uh, we'd still have an automobile uh, business and its ancillary uh, supplier of tires with uh, difficulties that would be uh, sent out to the public without, without regard to any problem at all of being asked to account for them. You know, the pr problem with claims like that is that they don't stand up to the facts. Now take the most famous case. You know Ralph Nader got his start by a book called Unsafe at Any Speed. It referred to the Corvair. Do you know that ten years after he launched his attack, and persuaded the public at large that the Corvair was an unsafe car. The federal government finally got around to investigating the safety of the Corvair. And its official report concluded that the Corvair was a perfectly safe car, just as safe as the alternatives available, and that Ralph Nader's claims were completely unjustified. Yeah. Why so that similarly with all of you, those extravagant claims, which I know you're not making on your own behalf, you're the <laughs> devil's advocate and a very good devil too. Thank you, I think. <laughs> And a very good advocate, too. <laughs> so, but the trouble Excuse with me, I just want to make this point, uh, uh, Professor Friedman. You are using the United States government, whose post office is often referred to by you in columns, in speeches, and in writings as an example of what happens when you give Absolutely. what ought to be the private enterprise's Absolutely. business to the United States right. government. Now you turn around and use this United States bureau bureaucracy to support your uh, defense of Ralph Nader. How, I mean, uh, why should I have any more confidence in the, in the government's review of the Corvair than in the government's operation of the post office? You shouldn't. I have no more confidence well, in that. Well, you certainly cited I, it to, to, to suggest... I beg your pardon. I just have as much confidence in it as I do in Ralph Nader's evaluation. So we're evensies then? That's right. So All then I either... Then there is no evidence. No one, neither Ralph Nader nor anyone else, has ever presented any evidence right. that justifies his charges. No one right. has presented evidence to justify the kind of charges you're making. Right. And those charges are simply untrue. It is not a fact that the world would have come to an end but for Ralph Nader. But more important... Take one of those charges that the cars would be devoted to cosmetics. If people want to spend their money on cosmetics, why shouldn't they? You mean to say you should be prohibited by the government from doing whatever you do to, have a, uh, to give a nice cosmetic image to your viewers? No, I guess I'm thinking that if we just leave it to Detroit, if we had just left it to Detroit in your own laissez-faire and you're wearing your mm. Adam Smith tie today... Um, Always wear it on yeah, TV. I know. Uh, <laughs> Let me tell you what I think. Let's just you tell me what's wrong with this. Sure. If we just, you know, tell now Ralph Nader to go somewhere sure. else and complain. Sure. And let's let Detroit and the free enterprise sure. system handle this. Here's what we would not have. We would not have collapsible steering wheels. We would not have padded dashboards. We would not have spring-loaded ornaments that bend back so that you minimize injury in the case of hitting a pedestrian. You would, uh, you would not have... I, I, I'm sorry. Well, first of all, I have no reason to suppose that's true. Long before... Ralph Nader came on the picture. The automobile industry had made cars increasingly safe. Brakes had become better. The uh, protection and the bumpers had become better. The doors had become better. They, when it turned out they were defective, the automobile industry introduced them. Almost all of the developments in automobile in that direction uh, had arrived and were on the way long before Ralph Nader came along. But if you didn't have Ralph Nader, if you hadn't had that movement, you also would have cars considerably cheaper You'd have them available to a much wider range of people. They would be using less gas than they do now, not more gas than they do now. You, uh, f after all, the thing that amazes me about people who make statements like this is their neglect to history. 
we, this country went for close to 200 years without a Ralph Nader and without these regulations. And that was a period in which this country had its greatest growth, in which people streamed to it from all over the world and were able to make a better life for themselves and their children. If you take the automobile industry in particular, since Henry Ford really revolutionized it, it transformed the nature of life in this country. The automobiles improved tremendously. They came down in cost relative to other goods. The effect of the, of the kind of regulations you now have have has been to make automobiles not more safe, but less safe. Why? Because by making them more expensive, they make it pay to keep an old car on the road longer. The average age of cars on the road has gone up. And old cars are less safe than uh, new cars. By making them more expensive, you've reduced the amount of foreign competition. We have a lot of foreign competition, but you probably know that there are many foreign-made cars that make no attempt to export to the United States because the cost of meeting all the particular regulations and standards make it uneconomic to do so. Well, uh, uh, they certainly haven't discouraged enough uh, to make Detroit happy. Of I course, mean, but I don't want to make Detroit happy. That's not my aim. Or, I want to make, make the citizen happy. I want to make the customer happy. Right. The but last thing in the world we want to do is yeah. to make Detroit happy. Right. Let's just, uh, if Chrysler folds, now we're left with two automobile uh, companies and... Not, a, not at all. We're not and they'll have here. even more power and they'll say, love it or leave it. Nonsense. Take it or... Nonsense. If we don't have any tariffs on cars from abroad, if we have free trade, the automobile industry of the world is in competition with Chrysler. Do you think that it was really, uh, and with General Motors and Ford, who offered the greater challenge to General Motors and Ford? Toyota. Toyota and Volkswagen. So where's this nonsense about there'll be only two car companies? Yeah, but I have no objection to there being a hundred car companies, if the market stands it. But I don't believe you ought to artificially prop up a third company in order to say we got three companies. This is Milton Friedman, professor, economics, the Nobel Prize winner. And just let me step here just a moment. We're gonna, uh, let me try and see if I can't uh, get somewhere in the next segment. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Friedman is our guest, and we hope you'll join us. just review for a second because and I don't want to bore you to death here but it, uh, this is really I f am fascinated by the dialogue and just to characterize Dr. Friedman's position at, which I should let him do you here better, is better you won't succeed uh, in not doing uh, just tell me how I'm doing here here is a man who feels that definitely uh, there's too much government intervention in everything and that if we just take Adam Smith's notion of the 19th century and let things the, let the laws of supply and demand work without all these uh, bureaucratic rules and regulations that, that uh, we would have... You think we can eliminate the gas shortage if we do that? The only reason we have the gas shortage is because it's made in Washington. There's no need for the gas shortage. There's a problem in oil. Oil is expensive. The fact that the OPEC nations have formed an effective monopoly and quadrupled the price of oil hurts us. No question. We pay more. But we have multiplied the injury to ourselves by our bad government policies. Here's Japan we were talking about a moment ago. Japan, it's 100% dependent on foreign oil. It has no gas lines. Why? Because le it hasn't tried to prevent prices from adjusting things. We, if the OPEC nations had been hiring our energy regulators as their agents... They couldn't have done a better they job. They couldn't have done a better job, but they didn't have to. They got it for free. Mm -hmm. uh, give me that speech about maximum and minimum now. The way to create shortages is to create a maximum price which is below what the free market would have otherwise. Absolutely. All right, so that even though we're appalled at gasoline, which is more than a dollar a gallon, your point is to get the government out of this game of regulation is to, you acknowledge, allow the 
gasoline to go higher. Excuse me. It, makes the, it may make the price at the pump higher, but it'll make the cost to the consumer lower. Who do you suppose is paying the over $10 billion a year budget of the Department of Energy, which amounts to nine cents a gallon for every gallon of gasoline we consume? Yeah, I saw you. Can you prove that? Of course. Nine cents a gallon for oh, the... Of course. Are there 20,000 people in the Department of Energy? Yes. 20,000 20, people. All of them making trouble. All of them... <laughs> Let me give you a very simple example because it's hard to go on. Here's Canada next door. Why is it there are no gas shortages in Canada and the price of gasoline in Canada is lower than it is in the United States? Canada's in competition with the world, but it doesn't have the same kind of Department of Energy we did. If we had no price controls, you have to ask where you start. If right now the only thing you did was to eliminate the price controls, mm -hmm. the price of gasoline at the pump would go up. Right. If simultaneously you also decontrolled crude oil and eliminated the regulation over the oil industry in this country, the price of oil would go down. Because you would unleash the protect a productive potential of the American oil industry. Explain yes. to me why it makes sense f to propose that we produce synthetic fuels that costs estimated up to $40 a barrel, while we will let people who pump oil out of the American land, oil well, some of them can only get less than $6 a barrel for their oil. Others can only get $14 a barrel, but we're gonna spend the taxpayers' money to produce $40 a barrel oil. Is that sensible? You're saying that's, that they get that because of regulation? That's all they get because of regulation. Yes, the regulation, the, the, the right. limit on the price fixing, the limit on the price which they may but, receive for oil. Now, where do you suppose the difference between that price and the world price goes to? Okay, let me just, how do you speak to this nightmare? Let's, let's do your thing. You're going to czar. We'll make you a czar. And you're going to mm -hmm. say, look, the free enterprise system is going to work. I'm not crazy about the oil OPEC monopoly either, but this is the facts of life. It's the geography, and it's the way we've got to play this game. Mm -hmm. And let's let it happen as it happens. $3 a gallon. Now, we have truckers shooting each other right now because they're of their frustration of the their inability reason, to pay them. Excuse me. The only reason they're shooting each other is because the government won't let them be free to set their prices. You have the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission, in turn fixes their prices. The Interstate Commerce Commission, in turn, decides who may and may not haul uh, freight. Do you know that if you want to haul freight between certain places, you may have to buy the rights from a company that doesn't own any trucks? There are many people in this country who get income out of the accidental fact that they own ICC licenses to transport goods between point A and point B, which they don't use, yeah. but they rent out for others to use. The total cost, the total value of all of those rights, a purely artificial monopoly value that has no economic counterpart, is in the billions of dollars. So if you could simultaneously reduce the cost of trucking as well by simply abolishing the Interstate Commerce Commission. You want to do that too? Of huh? course. Now we've got all... <laughs> but now, uh, isn't the res wouldn't the result be chaos with trucks coming from all different directions and obviously... Uh, obviously not. No. Why would the result be chaos? Trucks aren't going to come from all different directions and bump. Mm. Quite uh, the opposite. I no, I mean, I don't mean bump. I mean in the sense that... <laughs> in the, uh, how do... well... But I would say uh, I'm moving into the. Well, how don't you troubled by multinationals and the size of companies? And that's not what that's not what Adam Smith meant. Adam Smith didn't mean for Exxon to have a 60 and 70 percent profit. If you over hadn't, the, if you if you had first of all, of course I'm troubled by multinationals, in the sense that I would rather have a world in which there were a larger number of small companies. The question at issue is not that. The question is what are your alternatives and how do you promote such a world? One of the major reasons you have multinationals and large companies now is precisely because of the roles, role which government plays. Here is Chrysler. Get back to it. The, the chairman of Chrysler is spending full time, has hired a whole group of lobbyists in Washington. He is engaging in a political campaign to get the government to bail him out. Mm -hmm. Now, is that a productive use of uh, uh, effort? If he did, weren't doing that, if he isn't bailed out, Will the effect be that Chrysler will disappear? Not at all. Most bankrupt companies come back into operation with a new management and a clean sl financial slate and are more efficient. The fact that Chrysler goes bankrupt doesn't mean that his factories are going to go up in smoke. If they're worth using, they'll be bought by other people to be used. Like GM? And in fact, you'll have a strong... They might be. Doesn't that GM bother you? 
as compared with what? As compared to have the government own the factory and produce it? Do you, you know, can, can Sears buy Kmart, too, in your, in your room? Of course. You think so? Sears has been one of the great protectors of the consumer all over, all during its ex existence. As a matter of fact, you say, can Sears buy Kmart? The way Kmart has been growing, the question is going to be, can Kmart buy Sears? <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, <laughs> all right, but... But and that's I, an example. Now take that. In other words, you you really take you that. want the Justice Department out of this too, huh? I mean, you don't have any problem at all with with a the super most effective antitrust measure you could take in this country would be complete free trade, and the biggies will eat up the l little ones. That is not. We've true. already that seen the demise been, of them. Excuse me, that has never happened. There have been very careful studies made of what has happened to the concentration of industry in this country over the past hundred years, and except in those areas where government has stepped in. It is not true that the biggies have eaten up the smallies. In fact, it's often been the other way. And Kmart is a good example. It started from nothing. Sears was already a major conglomerate. Mm -hmm. And Sears has been losing, <laughs> losing ground and going downhill, and Kmart has been rising. All right, just one question before this audience is anxious to ask you. When you sit in your study and uh, throughout your, your career as, an ac as a professor, you've met students, and you've, you've probably dealt with every kind of question, stupid through... I guess I want to know whether you've ever temp been tempted to become politically revolutionary. Here's my question. When you see around the globe the maldistribution of wealth, the, the desperate plight of millions of people in underdeveloped countries, uh, when you see so few haves and so many have-nots, when you, when you see the greed and the concentration of power within, don't, aren't you ever, did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism? and whether greed's a good idea to run on? Well, first of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? You think Russia doesn't run on greed? You think China doesn't run on greed? What is greed? Of course, none of us are greedy. It's only the other fellow who's greedy. <laughs> this, the world runs on individuals pursuing their separate interests. The great achievements of civilization have not come from government bureaus. Einstein didn't construct his theory under order from, a, from a, a bureaucrat. Henry Ford didn't revolutionize the automobile industry that way. In the only cases in which the masses have escaped from the kind of grinding poverty you're talking about, the only cases in recorded history are where they, where they have had capitalism and largely free trade. If you want to know where the masses are worth, worse off, worst off, it's exactly in the kinds of societies that depart from that. So that the record of history is absolutely crystal clear. That there is no alternative way so far discovered of improving the lot of the ordinary people that can hold a candle to the productive activities that are unleashed by a free enterprise system. But it seems to reward not virtue as much as ability to manipulate the system. Uh, and what does reward virtue? You think the uh, a communist commissar rewards virtue? You think a Hitler rewards virtue? You think, excuse me, if you'll pardon me, do you think American presidents reward virtue? Do they choose their appointees on the basis of the virtue of the people appointed or on the basis of their political clout? Is it really true that political self-interest is nobler somehow than economic self-interest? You know, I think you're taking a lot of things for granted. And just tell me where in the world you find these angels who are going to organize society for us. Well, I don't even trust you to do that. <laughs> we'll let, alone, let alone myself. <laughs> One of the nice things about having your own show is when you, you're able to say at any time, any time, we'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> Friedman, the economist, is here, yes. Yeah, I, first of all, I want to say I loved my Corvair. I would have helped a whole lot to get through this winter. <laughs> How do people like Ralph Nader get to, to do the things, the great things that they do? Does somebody hire them, you know, or is it us that puts these people into whatever it is that does it? 
Of course, it's we who do it. We do it by providing them with assistance. We do it by providing them with political clout, by electing people whom they recommend. And that's a good thing. I'm, I don't object to that. We want a free society, a free democracy, in which uh, if somebody, if a Ralph Nader uh, has certain views, he ought to be free to express them. People who agree with him ought to be free to contribute money to help him pursue his objectives. Uh, they ought to be free to vote for people he recommends. If, if he doesn't have that freedom, how can I expect to have the freedom to argue the opposite point of view? So I don't believe there's anything wrong at all in the fact that Ralph has been able to get so much influence, except that I wish he had been, uh, he had been using his extraordinary powers in a better cause. Uh, we should also make the point that for all your misgivings about Ralph Nader, he is not crazy about regulatory agencies either. And he for a long time, and maybe even before you, wondered aloud about the appropriate uh, function of the CAB in regulating airline fares. And if any, any thesis has been demonstrated, it's, the, it's been, certainly been that over these past several months with deregulation, suddenly, what do you know, there are no empty seats on an airplane. No, no, you're quite right. A CAB has been a marvelous uh, accidental example. But so far as Ralph Nader and regulation is concerned, you are quite right. Some of the groups under his con uh, organization have produced reports on ICC and so on that are excellent reports on the evils of regulation. The problem is that his solution is more of the same. His solution is to substitute a different kind of regulation. His only objection is not really to regulation but that the wrong people have been doing the regulating. And so when you ask not what's wrong with what we've been doing, but how should we improve matters, he doesn't really have an effective alternative. What do you think is going to happen with the inflation? Will it continue at the same rate that we've been having? Well, uh, inflation doesn't ever continue quite at the same rate we've been having, but unfortunately, I cannot bring you any good news about inflation. Inflation has been on the rise. It's now running about 13%, 12% on a year-over-year -year basis. We may get some minor relief in the next year or so. I think it may go down to 8 or 9% at the lowest. But I am afraid that we will then be off on another round of the roller coaster. The path we have been on for the past 20 years is a roller coaster. We get up to a peak, we come down, we get up, but each peak is higher than the pre prior one, each trough is higher than the prior one. And until the American people have the political will to stop it, that's going to continue. Now give us the will. Tell us how we get that will. There's only one way you can stop inflation, and that's by having the government create less money and spend less money. And the reason we have inflation is because the public at large wants inflation. You people want inflation. You don't say so. No one of you will say, I want inflation. But I ask you, do you want the prices at which you sell things to go down? Not the prices at which you sell them. You want the prices at which you buy them to go down. What everybody wants is for the prices of the things he buys to go down and the prices of the things he sells to go up. But that's a neat trick if you can manage it. But isn't it, isn't it good old Adam Smith? Isn't that what he... Of course, it's good old Adam Smith provided you have a control in terms of the total amount of money available, but it's not good old Adam Smith for those printing presses to be pouring out paper right. money, okay. which, uh, which you and I and the government in particular can use. Right. We, don't, we don't create inflation by our personal behavior. We create inflation by getting our legislators, the people in Washington, to vote for more and more spending and by objecting to extra taxes and therefore by having it financed by printing money. Right. Let me just ask you one more basic question here, and I promise we'll get this audience in the act here. Um, did Adam Smith, or do you, pers how do you feel about this desperate need to grow? We have this... We have no desperate need to grow. Oh, we do. We brag about our gross national product. It's going to be a trillion. Of course we do. We don't have a desperate need to grow. A guy's got two franchises. He wants six. A man has three hamburger stands. He wants 12. We have no desperate need to grow. We have a desperate desire to grow, and those are quite different. I believe that the level of growth in this country ought to be whatever people want it to be. If the people at large, if each and every person separately was satisfied with where he is and didn't want to grow, fine. I have no objection. I don't want to impose growth on anybody. I want people to be free yeah. to but, pursue their own objectives. But it so happens 
that the American people have been a very dynamic, forward-looking people, and they have wanted to improve their conditions. But does, they does, haven't been wanting to stay But does still. numbers necessarily improve it? Haven't, hasn't the last haven't 30 years an, demonstrated that that we, hasn't worked? No, we haven't had an increase in numbers, and the last 30 years has not demonstrated that. Most people in this country are better off today than they were uh, 30 years ago, although they're worse off than they were six or seven or eight years All right. ago. All right, just one, let me chase you down one more time on this. General Motors wants to grow as well. That's okay with of you. Of course. They have a natural desire to grow. Huh? Right. Okay. But other people have an, also a natural desire, and other people check it. Oh. The check to General Motors growth is Toyota and Volkswagen. It's Checker Cab. Well, I think it's, it's interesting that the American checks have come Motors. from uh, outside this country. They haven't, always, they haven't okay. always come right. from outside so General, this country. General Motors, but the point I'm making is General Motors has more power to grow. No. General Motors cannot get a dollar out of your pocket unless you voluntarily pay it over. The government uh, can, there, and that's the fundamental difference. All right, here's where I'm going with this. You're having, you're <laughs> me, you give me a hard time trying to get there. But <laughs> I think as General Motors grow, grows, I see the possibility of abuse. Or as any company grows, as the Donahue Show grows, suddenly I decide Absolutely. I've got all the answers Absolutely. and start preaching. Absolutely. Now, your point is some guy will come along and shoot me down pretty good, yeah. and I lose, and that's the way the system The bigger they Fine. are, the harder they fall. Good. Gotcha. WT okay. grants being an enormously big company didn't keep it from going bankrupt. The New York Central being a big company didn't keep it from going bankrupt. Chrysler Corporation may be the third automobile company, but it's a $13 billion company. It's one of the biggest companies in this country. That yeah. isn't going to keep it from going bankrupt. Here's the killer, though. When somebody does come along with a better mousetrap, the multinational mousetrap company buys it. Oh. And now we're back to mediocrity again. And the intuitive, the, the initiative and the talent of the little old man in the shoe shop who came up with a better, is gone. Temporarily, there are new people coming up with the little oh. old men in the shoe shops. And one of the major reasons, as I was saying before, why multinationals are able to occupy the position they are is because government rules and regulations favor multinationals. Almost all government regulation favors big companies over little right. companies. And you think Exxon probably, you think Exxon ought to be able to buy Reliance Electric. Of course. And now, and what else you want them to buy? The whole, the hotels too? I mean, well, where are we going to stop? Look, if you say to Exxon, look, one thing we're going to do is to make it impossible for you to make any money producing oil. What do you think well, their stockholders want to do? have a hard time getting doing? the American people first to agree, all, to agree Exxon, with that type of thing. First of all, Exxon doesn't buy anything. There isn't any Exxon. There are people. Exxon is a corporation owned by individual people. It's the stockholders of Exxon who ultimately are buying it. And if we had, uh, if they don't like what Exxon is doing with their money, they have a perfectly good alternative. They can sell the stock. And as the stock went down, if the, if the stockholders didn't like it, it would pay somebody to change the policy which Exxon is following. We have a far greater degree of control over what Exxon does than we have over what a lot of our government corporations do. Milton Friedman returns in a moment. Mr. Friedman, you've spoken um, a lot today about corporations. What does the average citizen do to uh, help the inflation or to fight it? There is nothing the individual citizen can do to help or fight inflation in his personal behavior. All attempts to tell you it's the consumer who's doing, the wasteful consumer who's producing inflation is an attempt by the government to ship, shift the blame to somebody else. As a citizen, you can do a great deal. As a citizen, you can ex exercise your influence on your congressman at the elections to try to elect people who are committed to cutting government spending. As you may know, a group of us have been working for a long time on constitutional amendments to set a limit to total spending. Such amendments have now been passed in five states. We're working on a na federal amendment, an amendment of the federal constitution that would give the federal government a budget. I think the most important single step that can be taken to stop inflation is to cut down government spending. And you can play a role in that. Your personal life, you cannot do a thing, and don't let anybody kid you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good question. I worked for Sears for two and a half years, and every day I went past a little board that said Kmart 31, Sears 19, 21. <laughs> and I was just wondering, 
What well, happened? What do you mean? The price of the stock? Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. quoted it. And it yeah, was just, I know. I've uh, seen it all the time. <laughs> and I was in profit sharing, and I kind of started to wonder, with all Sears pushing to sell and to produce and just to be marvelous, what happened? What, why is Kmart? Why is Kmart? I'm not, a, I'm not a business uh, expert. I don't know why Kmart uh, went ahead of Sears. <laughs> but I if do. I knew that, I'd be in a different business. Well, all I know is that they managed, to, uh, they managed to appeal to the consumer. They made better decisions about what products to sell than Sears did. Now, who was responsible or why? You'd have to be an expert well, but in a way I'm not. Kmart was better at discounting than Sears. Well, fine. That's what consumers wanted. Fine. Then they served the consumer. Didn't, uh, when, when Sears decided that it would, uh, you know, approach or broach the issue of the arena of, of discounting, their sales went shot up. Well, they still and, But their profits diminished. I don't know anything about the details. For all I know, Sears is uh, streamlined. It's going to go and beat Kmart. I don't have the slightest idea. Let the market decide. The uh, oil-rich uh, Arabs are buying an awful lot of businesses in this country and yeah. farmland and things. Do you think it would be wise for this country to institute law like Mexico did in the 50s and 60s where it required that any company in land had to be at least over 50 percent owned by uh, residents no, sir, in the country? Right. I believe in individual freedom on, a na on an international basis and not on a national basis. I think you ought to be free to buy land if you want to in Mexico or anywhere else. And I would like those governments to let you. This country did not become great by preventing people from coming here from abroad and buying land and setting up businesses. Quite the other way around. And the reason we are making it so advantageous for them to buy here is because we're following such silly counterproductive policies. And didn't it do a lot of damage in Mexico, though, when uh, It did a lot more, much more damage to Mexico when they nationalized the oil industry. On the contrary, their measures to keep foreigners from acquiring assets in Mexico did a great deal of harm to Mexico, not good. Yeah. You must distinguish between what looks on the surface and what it really is underneath. Over here. Uh, why is it we have so many uh, millionaires and everything in the United States and we still have so many impoverished people who try to get up into the world. Why is it we have this lack of money where people who can't support themselves decently and get a decent job, where all these big men are up on top making oodles and oodles of money, they don't need it. They can only eat that much, eat in a and sleep in a bed. And what do you suppose they do it? If they don't eat it and don't, sli uh, don't use it, what do you suppose they, they do They hoard it. They and what do you mean they hoard it? You mean it? they put it under their pillows? That's right. No. They, they keep investing it. Investing it in That's what? That's right. Yeah. What do they invest it in? Well, in oil and everything where, I mean, all these other people who what are What do they invest it in? Don't get off the subject. No. What do they invest it in? Well, they invest it in a lot of uh, different things that the little people need. Well, do they invest it in factories? Yes. Does some of that money end up in machines? Yes. Do those factories and machines provide ordinary working people with jobs or not? What do you suppose the productivity of this country would be and of the, uh, the wage rate would be if the total amount of capital in this country today was what it was 100 years ago? Where do you suppose the improvements in productivity come from except from the, re the investment by people of their savings? But let me go to your fundamental question. First place, nirvana is not for this world. There is no paradise. Of course we've got a lot of people who are poorly off but if you look at it over time, if you get a sense of proportion, the well-being of the ordinary people has been the main thing that has been improved by economic progress and economic growth and development. And residual, most residual hard cases of poverty today are the result, again, of a failure of government. Why do we have a teenage, black teenage unemployment rate in 30 to 40 percent? because of two failures of government. One, a failure to provide decent schooling, which is a governmental responsibility. Has been, whether it should be or not, it has been. And second, because of a minimum wage rate, which prevents those kids who haven't had decent schooling from getting jobs at low pay at which they can earn the skills on the jobs that would enable them to rise to higher pay. If you look at the sources of poverty, you will find a very low, most of them are derived from bad, what I regard as wrong-headed government policies. Well, I'm trying to look ahead because I'm almost going to retire. Yes. And it's pretty Social hard Security making it go now before, you know, you retire. You're covering a lot of issues here. I might say, if Phil will pardon me, I'm going to cover all of these issues. Yeah, Much please let's get this plug in because it is an important program which is 
That's all I need is I've this one is going to compete now with guess who? Guess who? He's got his own TV show. I mean, I'm not insecure enough. Uh, this is on PBS, and you'll, your first show is in January. Isn't January 11th. There will be 10 one-hour shows covering all of these issues in considerable depth. Half-hour documentary, half-hour studio discussion with people from the other side. Mm -hmm. I may say we invited Ralph Nader, but I don't believe he's accepted. Uh, um, just before we break here, and we have to, I want to make sure I understand you. Because the government sets a minimum wage, we what does it, McDonald's do? McDonald's? It can't hire as many teenagers. It, it uh, improves its capital equipment to serve. It does less business because it has to charge higher uh, uh, hamburger prices. In the absence of a, of a minimum wage, uh, McDonald's would be able to offer a larger number of jobs to a larger number of youngsters, and they would be able to acquire some skills, and not only McDonald's. So we hire more people, more people get work, younger That's people. The younger people would work, and they'd get a chance to develop their skills to become productive members of society instead of being driven into a cycle of poverty and of welfare, which is absolutely deplorable. Milton Friedman, The Economist, returns in a moment. I want to know if you charge a lot for your services. In other words, how much do you get paid? As much as I, as the market will stand. <laughs> I believe, I believe in a market price, and I tell you something. I think people value what they get at what they pay for it. And what are you doing with your money? <laughs> that is my business and not yours. Dr. Freeman. I'd like to know your view on the busing situation, especially with the gas situation. Of course, I'll be glad to tell you my view on the busing situation. I tell, uh, the general, very little time, my, the fundamental idea is that people should be free to choose. That's the title of our TV series, incidentally, is free to choose. They should be free to choose whether they want to send their child to this school or that school or any other school. And the way to do it is to introduce a voucher scheme so that people can have freedom to choose. I am not in favor of compulsory busing. I am not in favor of compulsory integration. I am in favor of freedom. Uh, what would you say about uh, uh, voucher? The voucher what? I would have a voucher system. You said I had to keep it brief so I can yeah. only mention it. A system under which parents who chose not to send their child to a particular public school would be entitled to a payment like the GI Bill of Rights, a voucher which they could use at any school of their choice. Yeah, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm going to open a school. Very good. And I'm going to hire an advertising agency. But wonderful. And, and I'm we'll... going to have cheerleaders saying, go to Donahue High, because it's got the best football team. And I'm going to get all these vouchers. Tell me. And I'm going to have the biggest super school in the whole county. Wonderful. Marvelous. I don't know if, if, you can wonderful. Su if you can succeed, you cannot succeed by advertising what's not true. Ford Motor Company couldn't sell an Edsel that way, and I don't think even Phil Donahue could sell lousy education that way. Yes. Uh, you know, doctor? people think the public at large are a bunch of, of stupid people. They're not. Yeah. Doctor, is there anything the average citizen can do to protect himself from the ravages of the rising inflation? Unfortunately, there is very, very little he can do. The, uh, uh, it's a, it's a, I, I hate to say this, and yet it's true. The most effective protection against inflation is high living. How do you mean that? How do you mean that? I mean that, unfortunately, there are no assets which you can confidently acquire with the expectation that they will provide you a hedge against inflation. On the other hand, if you buy yourself a nice house, you buy yourself a nice suit, you buy yourself a picture to hang on the wall, you are protected against the ravages for, of inflation. So, in other words, convert your money into material things? Unfortunately, it's not a very desirable thing to do. Don't convert all of it. You've got to have some reserve for emergency. I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm saying that inflation is the kind of thing which leaves you with no good choices. But that sounds like playing the violin while Rome is burning. Well, tell me see, the alternative. The question was not what the nation ought to do. Yeah. I have no difficulty in saying what our governmental policy ought to be to end inflation. That's a different question. The question is, what can I as an individual do? And unfortunately, given the uncertainty of inflation, given the fact that real estate has proved a good hedge and it's proved a bad hedge, that stocks have proved a good hedge and they've proved a bad hedge, that government bonds are a snare and a delusion, that they have proved a very, very poor investment for the poor suckers who were induced by Uncle Sam to come into them. Unfortunately, there is no good way in which the ordinary citizen, the ordinary person, 
can really protect his assets against inflation. Dr. Friedman, I wanted to point out that a lot of uh, people will agree that medical care costs are terribly expensive these days. And some hospitals that I know of, particularly in the South, have cost containment program programs that are voluntary. Are these feasible? And if they are, why don't other businesses start them? Well, in the first place, <laughs> every business has a cost containment program. There is no business in this country that doesn't unless it's on the verge of bankruptcy. In the second place, in all of these questions, one shouldn't look at the symptoms. One ought to go back and ask what the sources are. The reason why medical costs have been rising so rapidly in the country is, again, I sing the same old tune, tune but it happens to be true. Because whereas some uh, 15 or 20 years ago, government spending on medical care accounted for something like 10, 20 percent of the total amount spent on medical care. That was mostly in public health and for veterans. Today, it amounts to something like 40 or 40% or more of the total spending, and that's what's been driving these prices up. Milton Friedman returns in a moment. Uh, you'd be against uh, mandatory wearing of helmets for motorcyclists, of too. Of course. I think people ought to be free to do what they want. Well, well, what's, a, what, what, what's wrong with the... Uh, why can't the government be, be paternalistic and maternalistic and care for its citizens? Well, that depends on what kind of government you want. Of course it can be, but it turns out that the paternalism tends to serve the interests of the people who are being paternal and not the people whom they are supposedly protecting. I am... And, and it's expensive. <laughs> I am not... I, don't misunderstand me. Uh, be, I'm not against all government measures. I'm not an anarchist. I believe we need a government for a certain basic functions. We need a government to protect this country from foreign enemies. We need a government to protect me from being bashed over the head by you. And because, but because you can find some valid function of government doesn't mean that everything government does is valid. And the problem today is not that we have too little government, but much too much government. Milton Friedman can be seen on PBS next year in several one-hour shows. Many thanks to this Nobel Prize winner for bringing his enthusiasm to our show, and thank you for your participation. Have a nice day. A year ago.